Romans chapter 11. Let's begin from verse 1. The Bible says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite for the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. And the Bible says, God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not what the scriptures say of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and beat down thine altars, and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? He says, I've reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this time, present time also, the Bible says there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then there is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You see, Paul repeating these words very fervently. And the Bible says, what then? Verse 7. Israel has not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election has obtained it, and the rest were blinded. The Bible says, according as it is written, God has given the spirit of slumber, uh, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David says, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Somebody say, Amen. Romans begins at a point where Paul is trying to give a contrast between the Jew and the Gentile. And the Jews walk away from God. They turn their eyes of God. And because of turning their eyes of God, there is an opportunity for God to open to the Gentiles. But the Gentiles are loved so much that there is an assumption that God will never turn again to Israel. Praise God. He gives an example one time of how Elias, which is Elijah, one time he realized that almost the whole of Israel had turned its back against God. And he starts casting them. Let them die. Let them be destroyed. And here are the news flash. God comes to this man and tells him, actually, there are 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to the image of Baal. The challenge Elijah was dealing with here was, he thought that because he was a prophet, he had the ability to see purpose fully. Some people are deceived into thinking that because they sit in certain offices, therefore they are granted access to certain things. And that again in its own presents a certain delusion. Many of you have read of a scripture one time where this young man prophesies, and then one old guy slaps the guy and tells them, from whence did God bypass me to tell you? Because some people think that God can only speak to them and uh, them alone, the only the other person, God cannot speak to anybody else except them. And we have people who think like that. We have people who think that God is exclusively for them, to them, and only them. Anybody outside there and hear God will never hear God. You understand? We have a similar situation where a prophet like Elijah, and I'm going to share more into that, a prophet, a prophet, a man of God like Elijah, has the ability to see things, has the ability to cause rain and stop it, has the ability to, to, to feed. He has many, many, many things upon his life. But his eyes were closed to the remnant. His eyes were closed to 7,000 men, yet he was a prophet in Israel. Praise the Lord Jesus. And I'm going to explain that a bit later, why it was so. Now, he gives an example here, and then he comes to verse 7 and he says, that what then Israel has not obtained what she seeks for, but the Bible says, but the election has obtained it and the rest were blinded. The election has obtained it and the rest were blinded. Israel woke up in the morning and started seeking God a certain way. They sowed and prayed and fasted and gave their all to this Almighty. And somehow they did not receive him. They did not walk in the grace for which they sought for. They did not find what they sought for. But there is another group which the Lord calls the elect. 
according to the promise. And this elect, the Bible says, obtained what Israel sought after and could not obtain. And the Bible says, and the rest of them were blinded. And of the blinded is both the Israelite, who has sought and not found because he's seeking on his own terms, but also there's the indifferent one, who is neither Jew, and that means a, a receiver, by, by, by reason of the ordination they carry, they are stewards of the mysteries. And there's also another, he, he's neither of the Jewish kind who will receive by reason of bloodline, neither is he of the Gentile that believed. So he's an unbeliever. And many unbelievers are blinded while the rest obtain. So there are two kinds that, of the people that are blinded here. There is the kind of the Jew which obtains in its own works and not according to grace. And there is the indifferent, which is neither Jew by bloodline, but neither is it born again as Gentile. So it's also, in a way, inclined into works because it knows not the way of grace. But Paul is trying to give us a bigger picture here. Why? God tries to establish a relationship with men, with people, according to grace. They resist the voice, they resist the mystery, they resist the blessing, and then they choose to go the way of works. You understand? And when they go the way of works, they obtain not. But then them, which, that's why he, he explains the issue. That if it be of works, then it is no more grace. If it is by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Then after explaining that relationship of grace and work, he comes in, fa- in seven and says, Israel has not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election has obtained it and the rest were blinded. Why? Because Israel is seeking for not after grace, but after works. Are you following me? Okay, let me explain it in simpler terms. Israel gets a God. He tells them of your own. He introduces the mystery of grace. Grace is older than the New Testament. Noah found grace in the sight of God. Moses knew this. David knew this. Everybody knew this. That is why Moses is telling, he, he curses them later on. That is why David himself curses them. You realize Moses curses the blind? David cast the blind. He, he's given a place where men have been blinded from the truth. Many, many people say, you have to be able to see in the spirit. Otherwise, if you walk in blindness, you're going to die. And you ask them, what is blindness? What is spiritual blindness? Live along the blindness men think is. Look at the blindness in scripture as God teaches Because today we have many forms of what people call seeing versus blindness that are not applicable to scripture. You understand what I'm saying? Some people think that because you can see a date, that means you can see. That's not sight. These men were not blind from death. Come on. And now if I say that, some people think, oh, you're against people who see deaths. No, I'm not against people who see deaths. I see deaths too. But that didn't give me sight. Do you understand what I'm saying? I prophesy too. But that didn't qualify that I see. Even a witch doctor can see. Even a sorcerer can see a death of birth. Even a... a, 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 a A person who has opened the third eye without a relationship with God can see a date of birth. I'm not talking about that kind of sight. We see those two. Let me give you an example. One time I went to Nkumba. I entered a meeting and the Lord gives me two names. I I said there is a guy, I mentioned both of his names. And I said he is outside praying right now without shoes. Bring that guy to me. So they went out. And looked for the guy and asked him whether he was so. He confirmed that the first name was his, but the second wasn't. But they brought him anyway. I don't know whether Hezo is here. Is Hezo here? Come, come, come. I, I want to help some of you understand that I'm not doing this because I have 
I want to open your eyes to what seeing is. Because there are some people who believe by hearing. Eh? You, you remember that guy? Yes, sir. What was his name? I, I, was I called Mukasa John. I called Mukasa John. Yes. So when I call this guy, he comes in and he says he's not Mukasa. For him, he's just John. Yes, yes, yes. But I described that he was praying and without shoes. Yes, he was outside. Uh huh. Now, yeah. I, I told him I have a prophecy for you yesterday. And I. But when the guy said that I am not Mukasa, I told him, You'll come to me when you're Mukasa. Did you hear? You'll what? Come to me when you're Mukasa. He came back five years later. Ask him. He came oh, yeah. recently to my office. Oh, yeah. What did he say? <laughs> he said that he, he kept being prompted. Every day he was being prompted. Since then, because they lied. <laughs> the guy lied. That he was not Mukasa. So I asked him, why did you lie? He says, because they had told me that you're a false preacher. So I didn't want to tell you the truth because I feared you're going to destroy me or something. So after five years, he came back for his prophecy. <laughs> you can go. These men were blinded. Don't think Elijah was not a prophet. He was a prophet. But he was blinded from divine purpose. He could not see that there were 7,000 men that had not bowed their heads to Baal. But he was a prophet. But you see, when you talk about that, some people say, ah, he's against. I'm not against. I always tell people, the apostolic cannot fight the prophetic. You understand what I'm saying? But I'm trying to bring a certain understanding and sanity to scripture here. Because many people are seeking for what is not sight. Since you prompt me, let me open some things for you. And I want you to open them so fast. John chapter 12, verses 40. He says, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remained the same veil and taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded their minds of them which should believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 10. Make the heart of these people fat, make their ears heavy, their eyes, least they should see with they are blind they are blind he's giving you many examples about spiritual blindness and it's not about deaths of birth it's another blindness why is this in scripture many times yet it's not emphasized in the church many times how can god repeat himself scripture after scripture after scripture he says who is he says, who is blind except my servant? Who cannot see save my messenger? And he's not talking about just blindness of how you can't see what is, go- what is going to knock you. That, listen, that is, it's good. It is good. You understand? To know the way to go by the Spirit. To know who to deal with. Which business to do. Which woman to marry. Which ministry to sit under. It's very beautiful for you to see. It's important. But that is partial. That is in part... Paul says we see in part and prophesy in part. He said, but when the fullness is come, the part is dealt away with. What is the fullness? The person of Jesus Christ. The revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. That is the true spirit of prophecy. He says the true spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. When I saw Mukasa Ivan and it was confirmed, that was part. The fullness is my ability to see in the Christ. Oh, you didn't get it. Fullness is my ability to see in Christ. Because the Bible says, He, Christ, is the fullness of things. He fills all things. He, in Him is the fullness. He is the fullness of all things. That means that perfect vision, there are people here who might not be able to see deaths of birth, but they have a full vision. Because they behold past that veil. And that veil is done away with Christ. But when you say that, some people say, ah, you're against. I'm not against. I'm not against. I'm not against. 
I'm not against. Do you understand what I'm saying? But whether I called out Mukasa, or oh, I didn't call him out. There was something that could make him full, with or without my prophecy. He's called the sure word. The sure word. That one, even if I don't call you out, you just get this thing inside your spirit. And God is repeating blindness after blindness, day after day, story by story, to make people understand that there is a bigger blindness in the body of Christ than just the inability to see your next husband. Over your husband. There's a deeper one. Listen, you can do without a man. But you can't do without Jesus. You can't do without Jesus. You can't do without Jesus. But now that has switched in our generation. To be continued. Isaiah 29 verses 10. He speaks of the same people. And he says, He says, For the Lord has poured out unto you the spirit of deep slumber, and has caused your eyes, the prophets and the rulers, the seers, he has covered. Now I want you to understand. When Isaiah says God has caused, he has poured, it doesn't mean that he is the one. I tell people, the Hebrew language does not have, usually, uses, when you look at the grammar, of the language, um, the way it's, it's written, the way it's spoken in Hebrew, you realize that in Hebrew, they do not have... Uh, permissive term. They have a causative term. So, what you read as the Lord poured out, it's actually the Lord allowed the spirit of slumber to go on them. That means he's not responsible to pour onto, but he has let it be for a reason. And I'm going to explain why. So, many times in the Hebrew, uh, many clauses are written as causative, yet they are just permissive. He just permitted it to happen. He's not the one who caused it. He removed his hand off the man and let it happen. It doesn't mean that he's the one who did it. He just let it happen. And I'll explain why he does. Okay? Now, he gives you two examples of rulers, seers, all of us. Men of God, men and women of God, Christians, believers. And the next verse says, and, 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 and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. Are you hearing me? And remember, they are rulers, they are prophets, and they are seers. But God, all of them are covered from this. When God brings this vision, it is like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one, now listen, the two kinds, that is learned saying, read this, I pray thee, and he cannot. The man who, who is learned in that dispensation, when they bring it to him to read, he cannot. And the reason he says is because it is sealed. And then they take it also to him that is not learned. And the man says, I pray thee, I am not learned. You see, there is a man who is learned. But when they bring this, it is like a book that is sealed. And there is a man who is not learned. Even if he has the ability to open seal, he can't read. Are you following what I'm saying? Are you following what I'm saying? There is a learned man to whom they bring this mystery. But it is sealed. He can't remove the seal. If you are a reader of Revelation, you know how the seal is broken. You know how the seal is broken. If you are a reader of the book of Revelation. Because it speaks of who is worthy to open the seal. And who does the Bible say? The Son of Man. That means the person of Jesus Christ can open that seal. But there's a reason why to them which are learned, even though they are learned, they carry not the ability to open the seal. That they have learned in a way of which the Christ is not yet revealed, but they know. That's why he asks this man, art thou a master in Israel, but knowest not these things? And that's at the time when I expect you to know these things, because you are a master in Israel, it shocks me that you do not know these things. Art thou a master? In Israel, but knowest not these things. You knowest not these things. So, mastery means that you are learned. You are given an opportunity to learn. But even with the ability to learn, you cannot open the seal. When you're, when you're taken uh, to the book to read, the only thing that opens to you as vision is that there's a seal on this thing. 
But how can a man be so learned that instead of going to the Christ, he is separated and pushed afar from the very Christ of whom he seeks to learn after. And yet there is an unlearned man here, and the scriptures don't talk about the seal. They talk about his inability to read. Because maybe he has access to the seal. Maybe he's of the foolish things of this world. That God chooses that he might shame the wise. That he might shame them that think that they are wiser than others. Think about it. Just think about it for a moment. Somebody say, God help us. Hey, hey, say it. Say, God help us. So you understand what I'm saying? So we have a challenge here where the gospel seems to be hid. The rest are blinded. And this blindness is the reason why they are seeking for what they will never find. They think that one word will take them from one place to another. Because you tell somebody, I see you're going to go to London. They think that's enough. It's not enough. Because what caused you to be stuck here, to seek after what you could not find, was a blindness that you carry. Now, imagine a situation like Israel. The Bible says, she's seeking after, and seeking after, of things she will never find. You're going to pastors, you go to evangelists, you go to prophets, you come to apostles, then you go back, you're, Ozunga, you're moving the whole world. You're seeking for stuff you will never find, and you're seeking, and you're getting more frustrated every other day because you keep seeking and seeking and seeking and seeking and seeking and seeking. And seeking. And the Bible says, you have not obtained what you're seeking for. And the things you're looking for almost seem like they look for certain people. I don't know if you understood what I'm just saying. Rebecca wasn't looking for a man. She had gone to fetch water. But she came back with a man. Are you hearing me? David was not seeking for an anointing of kingship. He was looking after animals and Samuel came looking for him. God has to make donkeys. I mean, because he has to find a man. Somebody shout hallelujah. Martha Mary. Martha is reaching out for our master. Our master is reaching out for Martha. For Mary, sorry. What you're seeking for is seeking for certain people. What you're looking for, it's looking for certain people. What you're trying to get to, it is chasing after certain people and trying to, please take me. And then they fall down and they say, leave me. And then it jumps again on them and says, I can't leave you. Because some people know not the way of the Spirit. They know not the way of the Spirit. They know not the way of the Spirit. Some of you, I wish you came to this understanding. You do not struggle with certain things, which now you are seeking for. And because of that, you have yielded to the wax. You're in labors and seeking qualification in your labors. And it's almost as though the more you work, the more staff refuses. The more you yield, the more staff refuses. The more you seem like you're serving God, the more complicated stuff comes. And it starts to look as though it was easier than when you didn't know God. And you start to think, maybe my knowing God. One time a lady came to me and told me, God is taking me for granted. She had cut her wire. She said, now I'm going to denounce him. But if I denounced him, I thought I should talk to a man of God before I denounce him. But I've made up my mind to denounce him. So I ask her, why? And she tells me, my father died, this happened, my business, everything fell. So she explained the story of failure. And says, every time things happen to me, I remember how God takes for granted 99 sheep because they've stayed there. Eh? And then goes for like a random wild guy who is going in the village. So I ask her, so where are you? He says, I'm the 99. 
I've been a good person. I've been praying. I've been fasting. Apostle, I've not done anything wrong. I've kept myself. I've been kept. I've kept my mind. I've walked right. I've gone to church. I've fasted. I've prayed. I've given my tithes. I've given my offering. I've done this everywhere they needed me. In the rain, I was in service. In the sunshine, I was in service. When it was okay, I was in service. In and out of season, I was in service. I refused to marry a guy who was not born again. I refused this and I did that. And then I did everything right. And calamity befell me. She says, now he's taking me for granted. eh? What do you think? Shouldn't I get lost too? Apostle. Apostle, tell me, shouldn't I get lost too? For the first time, I didn't have an answer. You know how men of God have answers? That day. Because I was thinking also the way she was thinking. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. She has done all this. And calamity has befallen her. You remember the scriptures? How princes are walking on feet and servants are walking on horses. Oh! You understand? And then the Ecclesiastes 6 of the evil thing in the world. Of how the Lord giveth a man might, fame, power and all these things. And the Bible says, And that man getteth not the power to eat thereof. And the Bible says, but strangers come. Ooh, strangers to what? The covenant. The Bible says they come and eat thereof. And God called it in Ecclesiastes 6, an evil disease. Some people are not sick physically. They are sick like that. They, they are not sick that they have temperature and malaria in their bodies. No. But they are sick like that. There is a lot God has ordained for their lives, but they will never even walk in a fraction. That's an evil disease. The Bible says it's better off if you were not born. Than not to fulfill the promise and purpose the Lord ordained you on this earth to. And men are blinded from this every other day. And they think that a short fix is going to take them out of one pro. Listen, short fixes will only make you happy for a couple of weeks. A couple of months and a couple of years. And the next day you're going to go back again to square one. That is why some people, there are many people who have not really tested the goodness of the Lord. Somebody say, hallelujah. Are you following me? Now, I need to show you something. Let's probably go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Because many people say, ah, why, why? Let's begin from verse 7. Why were they blinded? Why did God blind them? So it's almost as though it seems that God deliberately blinded them. But I want to show you how they get blinded. I'm going to show you how they are alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance in their spirits. I'm going to show you how. Let's begin from verse 7. He says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth let, will let. When he says only him who now letteth will let. It means when the mystery of iniquity is at work. You have the choice to yield to the mystery of iniquity or not. It's a choice. He says until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Which is Satan. Whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. You see how the devil is going to be destroyed. The spirit of the mouth of the Lord. It, how can you not use your mouth right? When even Satan is going to be destroyed by the mouth of God. And then you confess negatively. He says life and death are in the power of the tongue. They're in the power of the tongue. Even the Christ. Even God. is going to judge the devil with his mouth. He's going to be consumed literally. Because of the word that shall come out of the mouth of the Son of God. That's why you don't take your mouth light. Tell your neighbor, don't take your mouth light. Don't take your, conf- your confessions light. Mugambe, tomutia. Tell them, don't fear them. It's the only thing that can destroy Satan. It's the only thing. Only thing. And then you use it unwisely. Somebody say, Hallelujah. And the next verse says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. This is the, this is the deceiver, Satan is talking about, that is going to be destroyed. Now the next verse says, 
and with all deceivableness, I want you to hear this, of unrighteousness, in them, listen, that perish, this is why, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They receive not the love of the truth. So why are they destroyed? Very simple. God places truth there and they refuse it. They simply refuse to receive the love of truth. They refuse to receive the love of truth. So why are people destroyed? Simple. They reject Jesus. They simply reject truth. They simply reject truth. And the next verse says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Again here, it is permissive, not causative, right? That they should believe a lie. So when they refuse to receive truth, God says, okay, if lies come, let them believe it. And then they believe lies. Because they refuse truth. And truth came before those lies. And the next verse says, that they, may, they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Next verse. But we are bound, we, the elect. Come on, somebody pinch your shoulder. He says, we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Because, you see, he's again saying, beloved, they refuse to receive the love of the truth. And so they do not come to God as a beloved. The message of grace is the only revelation that can create a love affair between man and God. Because the law cannot perfect you before God. And God does not relate in love with the law. Now, when they receive the love of truth, not the wrath of truth, not the anger of truth, but the love of truth, which is the revelation of grace, Are you following? The Bible says, you become the beloved. He says, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief over truth. Somebody say, I'm the elect. Say it again, I'm the elect. And the next verse says, when to he called you by our... Paul is not talking about grace here. He's not talking about... Everything. He says, our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand first and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Because this is how you were saved. Who is following? This is how you were saved. Don't worry if your mind doesn't understand it. Your spirit is understanding it. How do we draw this difference? Be simple. If a man has believed, the one sign that you have believed is you cease from your works and allow God to work through you. The one sign that you're still not a believer is the place where you want to work out your stuff for God to approve over. For you to carry a boasting and say, I am the one who did this. If it wasn't for me, nothing would have moved. I'm responsible for this success. That's a man who has not believed. When a man has believed, they go out of works and start receiving and working by grace. And many people think that because we believe that way, therefore we are not people who believe in works. We do believe in works, but only as of those works working through us. Not as of our ability without the working of the Christ. Do you know how many, do you know how to tell that a man is under the works? It's how a man starts boasting after every success of his. And not point to the glory of God. You say, hey, so how did you do this? Ah, you know, I, I, I was smart, you know, and I, you know, I just thought about it one day. And I said, well, you know, let's just, just do it. You know, I just, I just did it. And it worked, you know, it worked. Just like that, you know. No help, no nothing. No God's help, nothing. It was just me right here. It's just me. Because every time you go into works, human effort, you always point to yourself. You never point about Jesus. But every time you point on Jesus and say this, if it wasn't for the Christ, that's a man who has, who has br- believed. A man who proves that he has believed. 
But God says many people are blinded from this simple truth. That it's not about what they do. It's about who they receive to work in them. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. That is why when we get into the, the gospel, it is not about what we can get out of it. It's about what he is willing to get out of us. Next year you're going to be driving a very nice car. Point to him and say, I drive this car because of God who works in me both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Next year, Fanero is going to double this size. But when it is there, we're going to tell him, uh-uh, he was an apostle grace. There was a guy inside him. He was called Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. But if I should get this and start now telling men, you see. But you see, God, no, 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 leave God alone. Leave God alone here. This was me right here. Trying to just be me. Doing just me. Then I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Do you know why Israel is seeking after not finding? Because Israel is seeking after its own strength. For all, oh, he says, he's praying for them in, 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 in the scripture. He says that I pray that Israel may be saved. For I bear them a witness that they have a zeal but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of the righteousness of God have gone ahead to seek their own righteousness. The Bible says refusing to submit themselves to the righteousness of God. They refuse. There was righteousness by faith. They refused it and they chose to go their own righteousness. I say, ah, God, we don't need you imputing righteousness on us. Uh-uh. Let us do our own righteousness. That's that everyone knows that we are. Let me tell you, the moment you begin that way, you're going to seek for stuff you'll never find. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's what happened with Israel. That's what happened with that story. Go back to, to Romans 7. What Israel have not... Where, where we're at... Give me the, the, the message of that. He says, and then what happened? When Israel tried to be right with God on her own, pursuing her own self-interest, she did not succeed. The chosen ones, like Apostle Grace and were those who let God pursue his interest in them, and as a result, received his stamp of legitimacy, the self-interest Israel became thick-skinned toward God. That means the moment the man continues to look for his own ability, he starts thickening toward God. He starts rejecting God without knowing it. And what does the next verse say? Let's continue the message. Moses, listen, he says, and Isaiah both commented on this. They were fed up. With their quarrelsome, self-centered ways, God blood their eyes and dulled their ears, shut them in on themselves in a hall of mirrors, and they are there to this day. David himself, the Bible says, he got upset. Even me, I'm upset. Some people fail to see it. And don't blame me. Moses was, David was, well, Isaiah, we are not the first one to cut wires. Hello, somebody. He says, David was upset about the same thing. He says, I hope they get sick. I hope they get sick in self-serving meals. Break a ledge walking their self-serving ways. I hope they go blind staring in their mirrors and get ulcers from playing at God. <laughs> I realize however mad I am, I can't be that mad. I can't wish a man to get ulcers. But what is David saying? What is Isaiah saying? What are all these guys saying? What is Moses saying? Even Moses, the giver of the law, he is shocked that these men are blinded from how these things work. I see people fighting. Oh, we don't believe in your doctrine. You're preaching grace, extreme grace, extreme grace. They are blind. They are blind. That's why glory cannot shine on them. Because they are blind. Oh, you're telling people to sin. How foolish can people be? You mean all of these educated people wasted time to come? You mean they they burnt their fuel 
and left their husbands and children home to come and tell them, see, and then they say, yeah, yo, they had a fellowship. Ay, 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 ay. Come and t- they are going to teach you how to see. Those are blind men. And up to today, the Bible says, every time the Old Testament is read, they are blinded. Every time the Old Testament is read, they are blinded. That veil can be done away with Christ. If they choose to believe that it's not in my ability. Otherwise, I wouldn't find a man who is 30 years in the gospel fighting grace with vigor. It's preposterous. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That's how blind people are to this message. Some people don't think that God can simply find you. Did we go to heaven for him? No. The Bible says he ascended. He took on the form of man and came in the likeness of a servant. And he came to you. If he came to you, everything else will come to you. That's why he says, if he held not his own son, will he not with him give you all things? He that did not spare his son and delivered him up for you, he brought him to you. Why do you think that other things you have to go for them? If Jesus found me in Kampala, the anointing will find me in Kampala. Money will find hey, 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 Money will find me in Kampala. Glory will find me in Kampala. Increase and multiplication, they will find us here. Somebody shout hallelujah. And that is what they call rest. Sabbat. We which have believed. The Bible says, have entered into Sabbath. We which have believed. We have entered into rest. I don't lose peace that something is coming. I don't lose. That's why when I find you anxious, oh, apostle, a man, a man, I'm like, no, 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 no. You're blind. You're blind. You're dealing with blindness. How can you leave sleep over? A man, oh God, bring him now. Oh, kill me. If you don't kill me, kill me. God, bring Shout to somebody and tell them, don't struggle. Rest. Oh, my job. If the job doesn't come through. If they, oh, apostle, pray. 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 Then they call you at midnight. Apostle, pray. 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 Apostle, pray. I'm, I'm anxious. I'm getting older. Get older all you want. Whether the devil wants it or not, woman of God, it will happen. It's called rest. Sabbat. Can I share a mystery on that? God is so passionate about rest. So passionate about rest. That he gets angry when men don't rest. No, read the scriptures. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, I have sworn in my wrath if they shall enter into he, he even became angry. Because men refuse to rest. There is nothing that angers God like refusing to rest. It angers him. It angered David. It angered Isaiah. It angered Moses. Apostle Grace. There is nothing that angers God like you being anxious. He says be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. He's talking about peace that passes all understanding. It guards your heart and mind in Christ. That's called Sabbat. Unfortunately, our brothers think it is Saturday. For them, they have only one day. But for me, I'm rested on Monday. I'm rested on Tuesday. I'm rested on Wednesday. I'm rested on Thursday. I'm rested on Friday. Saturday. Sunday. In and out every hour. All through. I own a rest. Rest. Does 
doesn't mean you don't work. Rest means you allow God to work through you. And Paul said, I labored more than all my brethren, yet not I, but the grace of God that labored in me mightily. Somebody say, I am rested. And I'll labor more than normal. Because God labors through me. Saturday. By the way, newsflash for any person who thinks that Saturday is a Sabbath day. Newsflash. The days of creation of God are different from the days of man. The days of God, one day is as a thousand in the world. So, when he rested on the what? The seventh day. When he rested on the seventh day, that was according to his day. The days of men are in the days of men are in Genesis 1 14. He says, Let there be, listen, lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. Next verse. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, days and years for the earth. Were for the sun and moon. Those days are different from his day. Can I don't get it how you say, I'm a seventh day. We honor the Sabbath. We honor it more. <laughs> you give it one day in a week. For us, we every day, we are honoring the Sabbath. The calendars they are using to make Saturday and Sunday are like five, four hundred years old. Before that, they didn't have a calendar. Gregorian calendars are new. They were very new. So before that, how did they determine Saturday and Sunday? How d- when did you count from the beginning of the world to the birthday of Sethi, Adam, Cain, up to the, the, when you up to now can know that it is Saturday? ha 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 They are blinded. God is passionate about your rest. Tell somebody, God is passionate about my rest. For us, we are in the Sabbath. Jesus told us, honor the rest. Honor the rest. Honor the Sabbath. Honor the rest. It's not a day. It's an experience of a man who has believed. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. First Peter 2 verses 5. He says, you also, say we. He says, you also are lively stones. You're not dead stones. You are lively. Somebody say, I'm alive. And he says, and you are built up as a spiritual house. And he says, this house is holy. So you see, that the men who enter this grace, grace was given to them. Righteousness was imputed on them. Faith was given them. Holiness was bestowed on them. The holiness they carry is not according to works. The holiness they carry is according to faith. They are a holy priesthood. That is why it tells you to put on the new man, which after him has been created in true holiness. True righteousness. True holiness. That new man, he he has has, has put on in in righteousness and true holiness. The the new man, you and I who is born again, eh? you carry true holiness as a trademark and nature. We don't teach you to be holy. We remind you that you are holy. Because he works holiness in you. Now you see a God who imputes righteousness on you. Works in you to kill all silly characters and all those silly habits you're dealing with. 
And then you start living a holy life because of the holy nature and character you receive. Because the new man has been created after him. He has been made to conform to the image. Conform. Do you know the meaning of conforming? Who knows the meaning of conforming? What is the meaning of conforming? Yes, to be fashioned after the nature of the new man. That is means, means to be conformed. He says, for whom he did for you, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many of the brethren. You are conformed to his image. You are fashioned in the likeness. You are pushed by reason of nature into him. That means I can't avoid to be holy. I can't avoid to walk a righteous life. I don't struggle to be what I'm already. Because God makes me. Somebody say, God makes me. Hallelujah, somebody. Now let's go back and finish. He says, you are a lively stone, built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus. And the next verse says, wherefore also, it is contained in scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Now listen, elect precious. And he that believes on him shall not be confounded. Now, I want you to see that to us who are beloved, we see him as precious. That means we see a price on him. We see him as of value. That's why we go to him. That's why we yield to him. That's why we submit to him. That is why we give our all to him. That is why we say, if it's not you, God, we, we are nothing. They don't hold him as precious. That's why they can do without him. To get salvation and their own righteousness. But any man who takes and beholds him precious will yield to him. And the next verse says, And to you, therefore, which believe, the Bible says, he is what? He is what? And he says, but to, And to him which is disobedient, the Bible says, The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. In other words, the very message people are fighting is the very message that holds the foundation of Christian history. It's the cradle of the, of the life of God. Without the grace message, we are destroyed as a church. And it's the very thing men are rejecting. Grace is not a doctrine. It is the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one that Filled him to maturity. Woo! The Bible says, full of grace and truth. That's the thing that matured the person of Christ. From being simply a technon into the heels of God. To whom the heavens opened to and said, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased. Here is this message. Here is this message. And the next verse says, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. And the next verse says, But ye, you, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And he says, That you should show forth. The problems of your generational caste. That should show forth the reason why you failed to get married. He says that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I shared in school of ministry recently and I made a statement. And I told people. What? puts a distinctive mark on our lives, my life. The grace by which we access revelation, by which we access glory, by which we access vision, by which we access the miracles that happen every day, by which we access the things that God brings our way, where we, there was no way with, by which they would come except by God. The distinctive mark is very simple. That sometimes I tell people, you have to learn to yield and break before the things that find you. That find you. I tell people, I could not have sought this message 
I could not have sought the words I speak every day. If I was, it would, ne- it would take a lifetime to even speak a fraction of the things that come out of my spirit every other day. But as men went on mountains to seek after those things, those things found some of us. That is why he tells the man of prayer and tells him, Ask, seek ye. Ask me of things and I shall show you great and unsearchable things. Of which you would not know yourself. He's not talking about men who go on mountains to seek him. He's talking about men who come to him to literally yield to him by the spirit of grace. And allow him to show them things that they could never search. There is a glory that will never follow a searcher. But will follow the man that is elect of God. There is a distinction that will follow a man who is chosen of God. There is a glory, there is an anointing, there is a mark that will follow a man who the Lord has bestowed onto versus the man who seeks that he'll get these things by searching them out. Search all you want. The great and mighty, the things that are fenced in are not things men search for. They are things that men sit under to yield by the spirit of grace. Give me an amplified. He says, call unto me. Huh? Give me a reply. He says, and I will show you great and mighty things, fenced in and hidden, which you do not know. They are fenced in. They are, they are revelations you can never read in a book. They are not in a CD. You will never find them anywhere. But they can find you. And for men who go on the mountains to seek, they will never find these things. Because these things find men who are rested. That's why I told people, is it the things we are doing because we sought God deeply? Or the things that find us because we rested in Him? Are we speaking of things that we stumbled on every time we went out looking for Him? Because indeed every time they went searching, they stumbled on to But rather for us, we are not talking of those things we searched out and stumbled upon. We are talking about those things that had to find us because we are the elect of God. If there is anything that blows my mind every time I think, it is how this infinite God places infinite things in finite bodies subjected to time, which is a finite element. It only means that there is purpose beyond us. We're not just going to sing and worship God in heaven. He could not have given me way more than my body could carry in the earthly tabernacle. Heaven and earth, he said, shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He has put something in you that will exist past the existence of the world. He has placed something, even if I was to live forever, I would still have a message every day. Because the Bible calls them the bottomless things which are of God. They can't, they, they, they. Now, how do you walk with the revelation of what eye has not seen? What ear has not heard? What has not entered the hearts of man? And he says, but he hath revealed it unto us by his spirit. That means you carry a spirit of a revelation. No man has seen. No man has ever heard. And has not entered the hearts of men. I have come to believe, and this is not bragging, it's the truth. There are things you'll hear out of my spirit that you'll never read anywhere. You'll never find in any book. You'll never hear any man speak them. The way I speak them. Why? Because I draw from rest. I draw from rest. Come on, somebody, draw from rest. Draw from rest. They boast of how they seek God. We boast of how God sought us. They boast of how much they've paid. We boast of how much he has paid. They boast of how much they know. We boast of who is in us and knows. Do you understand that freedom? Now, if that infinite God intended to put into you infinite things, which are eternal, that means they are endless, and time the element which we live in on earth, the time series, yesterday, today, and forever. It has an end. But this stuff put in you is the same. God the same. 
But God is manifested through his word, which is Jesus. That means that the word remaineth even in the time series of yesterday, today, and forever. That means it's relevant yesterday as is now and should be tomorrow. The time factor of earth does not move the word. The time factor of the earth cannot change truth. Nothing you're going through, whether it has delayed, can frustrate truth. I don't care whether it has taken years to manifest. Truth is still more powerful and eternal. And if the Lord said you shall be, it shall be and not otherwise. How can I go to my grave with all this that I know and wake up before the throne of glory and think for a moment that it was only for the earth? I've realized this one thing. The stuff he has placed in us is going to profit in heaven too. That is why in heaven there are some of whom he says, well done, good and faithful servant. But faithful to what? To the word. It's the same bequeathment he gives Timothy that gave these things to faithful men which are able to teach others also. It's the reason why the disciples in the book of Acts say that this cannot be reason for us to serve tables and ignore the word of God. They would rather not serve tables. They would rather ignore serving tables that they might give themselves continually to prayer and to the ministration of the word because it is the true food of our spirit. David says, I desire your word than necessary foods. He was not a man rushing out of the presence of God to go and waste time on Telemundo and a cheap soap opera. He was a man who valued the presence of God. He read the Bible. He read it. Listen, fall in love with the Word. Get your Word and read it like it is more than necessary food. Read the Word until you forget to eat food. Because it's all you have. And everything you're reading has a manifestation one day. You don't waste time. I tell people eternity is worth investing into. Even in heaven, we're not going to be equal. Even in heaven, we're not going to be equal. There are men who are going to be closer to the Father. Why? Because of what they knew. There are some people who glory in saying, I'd rather be a gatekeeper. I was not made to be a gatekeeper in heaven. Let them that keep the gates keep them. But I'm going to sit next to the Son of God. Sit next to His blossom, beholding His glory. Raise your hands. Speak in other tongues. I can only imagine what it would be like when we walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes could see when your face is before me I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart be? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Oh, to my knees will I fall, will I sing, hallelujah, would I be able to speak at all, I can only imagine, oh, I can only imagine. Somebody just raise your voice in a minute and speak in other tongues.
Thank him for his grace. Thank him for the rest. Now I want everybody to raise your hands in just a second. I want to say something powerful to you. I want to decree by reason of the anointing here. By reason of what has been spoken tonight. That things are going to start following you. Revelation is finding. Power is finding. The miraculous is finding. Finances are finding. Marriage is finding. Ministry is finding. Visions are finding. Dreams are finding. I see that somebody tonight has literally been released. From tonight, God is going to overwhelm and override you with the things that are going to come your way. You're not going to be able to withstand them. You're not going to be able to hold them. You're not going to be able to contain them. Power to May things find you. May whatever you've been looking for find you. May the people you've been looking for find you. May the opportunities you've been looking for find you rested in God. May the, the, the righteousness you've been pursuing find you as it is revealed to you imputed. May you walk in holiness effortlessly. May you walk in divine health effortlessly. May the Lord settle you effortlessly. May the Lord multiply you effortlessly. May the Lord increase you effortlessly. May you not struggle for promotions. May you not struggle for attention. May you not struggle for the eyes of men. May you not struggle. May you not struggle. Oh, oh. I see stars shining here. They're like lights. They just... They broke free. They broke free. I see like the Lord is going to make you shine. There's a reason why three wise men could see this star. And it led them to the Christ. God is going to make you so shine that men will look for you. 